Good morning, Creekside family. If you're able, stand with us.
the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above. Take this bread, break it up, take this wine. 
fill your cup it's my body it's my blood shed for you Lamb of God morning we're going to celebrate communion which celebrates the very essence of the gospel Christ's sacrifice of himself for us if as we sang this morning if you've been forgiven and been redeemed we invite you to join us if you're not yet a Christian we are glad to have you here uh, to witness this we realize you wouldn't feel comfortable celebrating something you don't believe in yet but we're really glad you're here to, to be part of it and uh, this is not something to rush into or to enter carelessly. Scripture says that each person examine themselves and then let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he uh, who eats the bread unworthily drinks judgment. But if we judge ourselves, we won't be judged. So let's take some time to just ask God if there's anything I need to confess or make right, anybody I need to forgive or anybody I need to ask their forgiveness, and then we can celebrate. Scripture tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples together to celebrate the Passover. And during that meal, he took bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took a cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Remember me as often as you drink it. And greater love has no man than this, than he lays down his life for his friends. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for laying down your life for us. We thank you that by one offering you've made perfect forever those who are sanctified by faith in you. And we pray you'll help us to live as forgiven people. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and we'll sing this last verse together. Take this bread, break it up. Take this wine, fill your it's my body, it's my blood shed for you.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it is not the rest, but it is you. It is Christ in our stead, and you can do nothing apart from us. So thank you, Lord, for this day, for this morning. Just speak to your spirit and Lord, may your word continue to flow as we choose to accept it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Well, welcome to Creekside. We're glad you're here worshiping with us. Uh, go ahead and take a seat and watch this thing. Good morning, Creekside. If this is your first time here, welcome. We're so glad you're here and would like to offer you a gift, the drinkware of your choice. You can pick this up at the information desk in the lobby after the service. If you would like more information about Creekside or there's something that we can be praying about for you, please fill out the gray card in the seat back in front of you. And if you're interested in serving at Creekside, please fill out the red card in the seat back in front of you. You can drop these cards in the offering slot. All infants through eighth graders may now go to their classes. Parents, if you haven't registered your infants through fifth graders yet, you can do that now in the Children's Center lobby. Everyone else, stand up and say good morning to the people around you. It's been a while since I've been in second service. You are so well behaved now. What did you do with my church? <laughs> Good to see everybody. You know, uh, during the Second World War, thousands of Allied prisoners were held in prisoner of war camps throughout Southeast Asia. And the goal of the Japanese army was to thoroughly break their will. They had to bow to their guards, they weren't allowed to look a Japanese soldier in the eye. They were beaten, tortured, and forced to work long hours in the hot, humid jungle. But the thing that really broke them was the lack of food. They were only given a handful of rice each day, and they slowly began to starve to death. They became increasingly lethargic, their teeth fell out, they became susceptible to all the tropical diseases of the jungle, they were given no medical care, and many simply gave up, just crawled up and died. And, and I'd like to suggest that those prisoner of war camps are a picture of the church in America today. Because most observers will say there's really little difference between people who go to church and people who don't go to church in this country. 
The values are about the same. The rate of divorce is similar. In fact, a friend of mine said uh, he has a harder time getting paid by the Christians he does work for than by the non-Christians. There's very little difference. And the question is, why are American Christians so weak and ineffective? And I'd say the same reason that the Allied soldiers lost their will to death, were starving to death. Jesus said, if you stay in my word, you're truly my disciple. That means I can't be a disciple of Jesus without regularly feeding on his word. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The difference between us and the Allied soldiers is we are starving by choice. We're the junk food church. We feed on other books, podcasts, videos, movies, anything but the word. And uh, as we continue in the gospel according to Luke, we're going to look at a parable where Jesus teaches that a diet of his word is just as essential to our spiritual strength as good food is to our physical strength. So let's pray and, and jump into the scriptures here. Father, your hands made us and fashioned us. Give us understanding that we may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see us and be glad because we wait for your word. We pray that you'll give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to trust and obey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Let's start it. Parable of the Soils. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. A parable is just a simple story with a deeper meaning. The sower went out to sow his seed. By the way, it's, it's helpful to understand that in Israel, the way the farmers sowed their, their land is they would just go out in all early winter during the rainy season and they would have a big bag of seeds slung over their shoulder and they would just indiscriminately throw it everywhere. That that's, was the practice. And that's why, Jesus goes on, the sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And as he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Imagine that you're, you're hearing this for the very first time. Now you've grown up in an agrarian society. You, you may not be a farmer yourself, but you're very familiar with farming. You, you've seen lots of sowers. And it would be kind of like if Jesus told this parable today, he would say, uh, a bunch of cars are driving down the freeway. Some cars take the first exit. Other cars take the second exit. But other cars take the third exit. He who has ears, let him hear. <laughs> what? What's that mean? What's the point of that? And that's the thing about the parables. Nobody understands the parables. The people don't understand the parables, and Jesus' disciples don't understand the parables. And, and that's for that reason. Let's look at the reason Jesus teaches in parables. His disciples began questioning him, saying, as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest, it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Nobody understands the parables. But Jesus' disciples come to him and say, what's that mean? And he explains it to them. And so the parables become kind of a form of judgment. Jesus quotes here from Isaiah 6, uh, 
where, where Isaiah says um, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. The parables are dividing the people between those who follow Jesus and those who don't. Those who follow him get to understand what the parables mean. Those who don't, don't. That's the point. He's, he's using the parables to show what's happening in Israel. That not everybody is believing in him. Not everybody is following him. Those who follow learn more. Those who don't, don't. Now another thing, notice he says these parables are to explain the mysteries of the kingdom of God. In the Bible, a mystery is something that was not known in the past, but now is being revealed now. In the Old Testament, the, the, the Jews thought that God's kingdom would come when God's Messiah ruled the world from Israel. So it was a political kingdom. And, and God's Messiah would make all things that are wrong with the world right. That's what they expected. But that's not what's happening here. Because for that kingdom to come, according to Deuteronomy, all of Israel has to repent as a nation and welcome the Messiah, and that's not what's happening here. So the kingdom of God is not going to look right now the way they expect. It's the mystery of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is still coming because the king is here but it's going to look much different than what you expect. And so throughout Luke, you'll see Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is like, it's like a sower sowing in the sea. It's, it's like a, a net uh, that takes fish out of the sea. It's like a field full of wheat and tares. It's a picture of what the kingdom of God is like now, which was not revealed in the Old Testament, in the, in the period of time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. We could call this the age of choice because you get to choose now whether you want to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God and follow God or you want to rule your own life. So that's why he calls it the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? So now let's look at, as Jesus explains what this parable means in verses 11 through 16. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. What is the seed in the parable? What is the seed in the parable? The word of God. Okay, got it? Okay, just want to make it clear here. The seed is the word of God. Why would Jesus compare the word of God to seed. Seed have life in them, don't they? The difference between a pile of dirt and a garden is a seed. Because the seed produces a plant, which produces more seeds, which produces more plants. And that's what the word of God does. The word of God is living and active and reproduces the life of Christ in us, if he'll let it. That's the idea, that the word of God is living. It's something that produces life. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he says, the word of God which performs its work in you who believe. That's why Peter and James both say we are born again of the word. The word makes us new people. The word produces new life. The word renews our mind, transforms our character. It is living and active, if we'll let it. Paul called the word the sword of the spirit, meaning this is the tool the Holy Spirit uses to do his work in our lives. If you go through the Bible and look at everything the Holy Spirit does, you'll find that it, he does it by the word of God. So if I cut myself off from the word, I've cut myself off from the ministry of the Spirit because the sword of the Spirit is the tool the Spirit uses in my life. What is the seed? Word of God, okay. Now, the soils are the different ways people respond to the word. What age are we in? We're in the age of choice. So 
people have a choice of how they will respond to the word, and that's what the soils. Okay. So the, the farmer is sowing the seed, and some of the soil, some of the seeds, falls on the road. Those beside the road are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so they will not believe and be saved. Uh, uh, my guess is that at this point, the disciples are pretty excited about the huge crowds that are following Jesus. But Jesus isn't excited because he knows for a lot of them what they hear will be in one ear and out the other. The road are people who do not respond at all to the word. They don't understand it. They don't believe it. The word doesn't penetrate just like word on a hard soil wouldn't penetrate. So in one ear and out the other. They're their body is in church, their mind is elsewhere. They don't remember anything they heard by the time they walk out the door. Now, that's none of you, I know, but, but, uh, but uh, years ago, Lori and I had, a, had some friends and, that we socialized with occasionally, and, and so one, one day they announced they were going to come visit our church. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to have to work hard on that sermon. And so I, I really worked extra hard that week and tried to make it as simple and as obvious as it could be. And I think I did a pretty good job. But they came and, and sat through it, and afterwards I asked him what he thought, and he said, ah, it's just all God talked to me, and changed the subject. It's the road. Nice people, good people, but no apparent spiritual interest at all. And, and all of us, or most of us, have been there at one time or not in our lives, haven't we? Some of you are still there today. So that's one response. No understanding. The road doesn't understand. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while. In time of temptation, they fall away. The rocky soil responds much differently than the road. They are so excited about what they hear. Wow, I love your church. I've never heard the Bible taught that way. This is changing my life. This is great. They, they are so excited until they're not. And then they disappear. They come on strong. I want to be in the choir. I want to teach Sunday school. I want to be in a small group. But once the emotion is gone, there's no faith there. There's no conviction. It was all emotion, and when the emotions are gone, they're gone. That's, that's the rocky soil. Nothing inside of them actually changed. It was just temporary feelings. Let's go to the next one. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Is, is that my imagination? <laughs> okay, thank you. A few thorns there. Um. <laughs> Here's a third way Jesus says that people respond to the Bible. They believe it, but they don't make it a priority. Just as thorns and weeds choke a plant so it doesn't mature or bear fruit, so these people are choked by other things than the word as they fill it up in their lives. Barna Group did a survey of Christians a while back ask them how they felt like they were doing in the Christian life. And it's very interesting. Nine out of ten said they were doing well in worshiping, how they treated people, how they were getting on in life. Nine, Ninety percent, that's pretty good. But where everybody judged themselves below average was in their knowledge of the Bible. Why are Christians suffering from biblical illiteracy in our country. In a country that never has had so many Bibles 
and versions of the Bible and ways you could access the Bible. Riches, worries, this life. They believe it, but they don't make it a priority. They're distracted from the word by, by uh, stress and strain of everyday life, by their worries for themselves and for their family, by looking for a quick fix uh, through, a se- through a seminar or a counselor, uh, by our jobs, by our hobbies, by our travel, by our shopping, the list goes on and on. Why are most American Christians immature, unfruitful? Weeds, just the weeds. Maturity is as much a result of what I separate myself from as what I embrace. So the parable of the soils reveal different responses to the word of God. The road, no understanding. The rocky soil, uh, no convictions. The thorny soil, no priorities. Let's look at the good soil. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. I had been a Christian a few months and uh, was really struggling. I was a student down at Long Beach State, and uh, God had been such a powerful reality for a while, but he just had kind of faded. And sin had kind of returned with a vengeance. Um, I was having doubts whether what I experienced was real. I was really struggling. And I remember walking out of the Long Beach State Library and running into my buddy Greg Knapp. Now, Greg had been a Christian about six months longer than I had been, and he was the boldest guy I'd ever met. And he just, he would talk to everybody about Jesus. He was excited. He was everything else. And so he said, hey, John, how you doing? And I began to kind of give him my lament. And Greg said, well, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. See ya. Took off for class. Greg was bold. He wasn't necessarily sensitive. And, uh, but really, that was all I needed to hear because I, the Word of God. I forgot about that. I wonder if the Bible has anything to do with this. So I began uh, going to the library an hour before class every morning and just reading my Bible. And not too long, the sense of God's presence returned. I began to see my life changed. My vision became clear. I began to realize what God wanted me to do. It is impossible to really experience the power of God apart from the word of God because what is the word? It's the sword of the spirit. It's the way the the word uh, works in us. That's why uh, Peter says, long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. That's why Paul says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them, so your progress will be evident to all. That's why Jesus says, if you stay in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There's no mystery about spiritual growth. It is the result of putting the word in your heart and mind and letting God work on you. Let's look at, we'll take a little closer look at the good soil. These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. First notice that good soil holds the word in its heart. It holds it fast. It takes the Bible seriously. It reads it carefully. It doesn't just go through the motions or put in time. It really wants to know what God says. It does what God says. It loves what God says. They honestly want to know what God says. In, in Jesus' day, there were a lot of men who had much of the Bible, Old Testament, memorized, and they heard it t- taught every week on Sabbath. And yet they didn't believe in Jesus. So they weren't good soil. Uh, we've all met people who can quote the Bible freely and who are obnoxious people, right? So if the Bible isn't changing my heart, isn't changing my desires, I'm not really good soil. So it starts in the heart, doesn't it? If the word doesn't change my heart, I'm not good soil. Secondly, good soil 
reads the Bible carefully and consistently, it, it holds it fast. It bears fruit with perseverance. Last January, I, I shared with you a study from the Center for Biblical Engagement how people who read the Bible uh, once a week to three times a week saw very little change in their lives. But for some reason, kind of the minimum daily dose was four times a week because people who read the Bible four times a week or more saw incredible changes, incredible their sense of God, the sense of God's power, the sense of what God wanted to do. And since I shared that, a number of you have come to me and said, that works. I started reading the Bible every day, and I can't believe the difference. I can't believe how real God is. I can't believe how clear I see things. I can't believe the changes he's making in my life. Those who read it most often see it change them the most. So what's the difference between the soils? The road doesn't give the word a second thought. The rocky soil settles for feelings. The thorny soil doesn't have time. The good soil listens to the word carefully and consistently. Look what James writes in James 1, 22 through 23. He says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a, like a man who looks, and the word he uses for looks there is glances. Just a brief glance. It's like a man who glances at his natural face in a mirror, for once he has gone away, once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. When I was single, I lived with six other guys in a big apartment in Berkeley. And we had one bathroom there. <laughs> and uh, this is a big bathroom, but it had a huge uh, wall mirror there. And it was interesting to watch how most of us used that mirror. We didn't. <laughs> Just kind of glance at it on the way out the door. And, and you could tell because we would leave there with shaving cream still on an ear or or mismatched clothing, or just all, but we had one guy who was kind of like a male model, and uh, every hair was in place, and everything he wore went together, and, and uh, all the blemishes were taken care of and stuff like that, because he would spend so much time just gazing at himself in that mirror. <laughs> and that's what, what James is saying, if you want the word to change you, you have to gaze at it and then use it to correct what you see. Because then you will be blessed in all that you do. J James is just repeating what Jesus says about good soil here, right? Jesus explains now to the disciples why this practice has such a powerful effect. He explains why he speaks in parables. Now, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light, for nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not become known and come to the light. Same question. Does Jesus tell the parables to reveal the truth or to hide the truth? to reveal it, right? He says you don't light a lamp and then stick it under the bed. You light a lamp to give light to the house. And I'm not making this stuff difficult to understand, to hide it, but to reveal it. Do you see that? So take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. I used to wonder why the Bible was so hard to understand. If God wants us to know him, if God wants us to follow him, why doesn't he make it more obvious? Why doesn't he make the Bible like People magazine? You know, just, oh yeah, I see that, that's easy until I realized that it was the stuff that was the most difficult for me to understand, that once I understood it, it changed my life. 
lot of you I've, I've shared about how transformational understanding Romans 6 was. I read Romans 6 for a long time and I could not understand it. I just didn't, I knew it had something to do with how to walk with God, but I just could, it was too complicated. So I went to the commentaries and they were more confused than I was. And so I had, I had to go to Jesus and say, what does this mean? I don't understand this. And as I stuck with it and studied it and read it, he revealed it. I suddenly realized what it's saying there is that when I came to Christ, I died. And I became a brand new person. And because I was a slave to sin, but now I'm freed from sin, I can live the life God commands me to live. I don't need more power. I don't need more knowledge. I don't mean, I just need to do it. I just need to say no to sin and yes to God. And when I finally understood that, it changed my life. But it took a long search, frustrating church at search of time, to really finally see that's what it said. I think Jesus makes the Bible hard to understand, so we have to come to him and say, Lord, teach me. I don't get it. And we just stick with it until we do. And that's what changes our lives. Does that make sense? So Jesus says, take care what you listen to so you'll be good soil. In, uh, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, Satan said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. You've been fasting for 40 days. You're starved. Do you have the power to turn stones into bread? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's quoting Moses from Deuteronomy. Moses is giving a speech because that's what Deuteronomy is, it's a big speech, to the children of Israel after 40 years in the wilderness. And he says, remember how God provided food for you every single day for the last 40 years. Every day you got up and there was manna on the ground, you gathered up and you ate it. God provided food for you so that you will know that just as that food kept your physical body alive, so his word will keep your spiritual life alive. So Jesus says, I don't need food. I've got God's word. That's my priority to live by that. That's what good soil does. It lives on the word of God. How strong you are today really depends on what you've been doing with the word. So here's my challenge. You may have been the road, the rocky soil, the thorny soil for the last year, but you can become good soil today. And I would recommend committing yourself to reading the Bible just 10 minutes every day reading it slowly and carefully, and writing down anything you see. The key is you do it with a whole heart, and you do it every day. And see if it doesn't change your life. See if letting the power of that seed into your life doesn't begin to produce a new life, a new power, a new clarity, a new joy. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your word. I pray that all of us will take it seriously. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Proverbs 24, 13 and 14, my son, eat honey, for it is good. Yes, the honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is thus for your soul. If you find it, then you will have a future and your hope will not be cut off. What's the seed? What are the soils? Which soil do you want to be? Go out and be gluttonous. (laughs) Have a good day.